So yeah, I'm Colin Hemmings. I'm a CTO at a company called Outlier. Um, just as a kind of quick show of hands, who's using Erlang at the moment or has used Erlang? Production, a couple of people, not bad, not bad. Okay, so yeah, um, most of this talk is about um, Erlang, um, why we chose Erlang. Um, as a kind of subplot, um, I'm gonna be talking about um, my overly opinionated view of how to build uh, software as a, in a startup. Um, with some quotes and um, a few pictures. So, um, yeah, I tend to kind of like putting quotes into the speeches. They're, um, um, I like the kind of concise wisdom that's passed down from smart people throughout kind of generations, um, either in tech or outside. So this is a um, good one from uh, Thomas Edison. Um, this one's just funny. Um, uh, obviously, the, uh, the infamous Donald Trump. So who are we? Um, so, um, we're a monitoring company, so if you'd heard of Data Loop before, which you might not have done, that's us. We've just kind of rebranded now to Outlier, um, and yes, we provide monitoring. So, the aim of our application is to provide civil service monitoring, um, kind of primarily targeted at um, companies that are running microservices. Um, so, the approach that we have is we allow you to kind of devolve responsibility of your monitoring down to the individual teams. So the teams working on microservices can own their monitoring as they do with their code and making sure it stays up and running. So if they need to make changes to how they monitor an application, uh, they can do. They don't need to get anyone else's help. They don't need any kind of changes being made by the uh, operations team. But at the root of it, we're a uh, replacement for Nagios, Graphite, StatsD. Um, we kind of allow you to collect your data to visualize it and alert on it. Um, and yeah, at the moment, we're, um, we're processing around 12 billion measurements per day, um, and that's kind of linearly scrolling up, linearly scrolling up at the moment. Um, yeah, and so we kind of try to support open standards so that you can just um, install the application, get up and running, and integrate with uh, your current monitoring stack or tools that you're using. We also have Docker support, which you know, is the in thing at the moment. So, start up. So, um, yeah, I thought we'd give some context around kind of um, what we do and kind of how our organization works. So, um, this kind of leads into why we chose Erlang as well. So, obviously, this is uh, Silicon Valley, which has pretty much been my life for the last three years. Um, and it's kind of scary how true to life this actually is. And the startup life is as mental as this um, show makes out. Um, so I've worked on several kind of large software projects throughout the years um, and all have their own challenges and um, issues, but there's nothing quite like building a, an application for a startup. Um, yeah, when you're working as a startup, the kind of time is critical. It's usually important, but it's especially critical during uh, building an application for a startup. Um, you have to release quickly. If, you release, if you're slow to iterate, then you're going to die. You need to prime product market fit, which means flexibility. So you need to kind of work out where your market is, adjust your product um, to kind of stay cutting edge and actually kind of find some people that will pay for what you're building. Also, you need to be kind of quick to scale. So these things tend to kind of hit you in the middle of nowhere that um, you're fine and then all of a sudden you, you've got issues. And you can usually buy yourself some time, but you need to be kind of strategic and always looking at where you're next going to change your application to, to meet the, the levels of scale. There are some caveats to this. So um, you can get away without being these if you kind of feel, fulfill some of these criteria. So if you're well funded, um, which isn't such a case in uh, the UK, it's more of a, a Silicon Valley thing. So if you're raising 10, 20 million dollars of seed funding up front, then you've got like two years to build your um, your, your application before you need to actually start making revenue. Uh, if you're making a lifestyle business, you don't need to make that much money, then you can kind of get on with it. Um, and yeah, some people are just lucky. They're, they're kind of the, the first in the market. They're, um, they can get by with you know, making mistakes and, um, and still survive. So it really comes down to a, a business first thing. So you kind of, you can't really build your application in stealth. You need to be out, you need to release it to users, you need to get feedback um, and, and, and iterating from there and, and just to find something that's gonna, actually gonna sell. And as a kind of contrast to how you usually like to build applications, being engineers, quality can take a backseat. You don't have a lot of time to 
um, over-engineer your application or make sure it's the most glossy, shiny code there is. You kind of just have to deliver. Um, which also kind of comes up when you're hiring people, when you ask, you know, you know, what your unit test coverage is like and, and you don't have any, there's not much of an answer for that. Um, so the first version of our product was the, uh, the monolith. So when I was building these slides uh, over the last couple of days, I kind of searched for monolith and this image showed up. And uh, obviously it's um, Minecraft. Um, and I kind of wondered you know, actually what the... Uh, what it was, um, <laughs> I can appreciate having played Minecraft a little bit, that the, uh, the, the, the size of the structure must have taken a fair amount of time to, to build, but yeah, I didn't quite get it. So um, scrolling through the page, it was actually a, a question on a forum. Um, you know, someone built this thing without actually having any idea what it was actually going to be. Um, and so uh, <laughs> they, they, yeah, they were asking for um, some kind of um, advice on what they could actually do with this thing they had built. Um, and the, the, the kind of top and the best answer was um, <laughs> giant urinal, which, um, yeah, I can see that. Either that or it looks a bit like a soda stream. But um, I kind of took heart in this that, you know, it's good to see that student loan isn't going to uh, waste. Um, so, yeah, the actual monolith we built. So the, the first version of the application was a, um, a Node.js application, sat in front of MongoDB, and we had a, a Python agent which installed on the host for collecting metrics and... Um, actually monitoring what the servers were doing. So this is the kind of, um, at the time, the, the hipster stack. Um, we had Node.js and we had Mongo in there. Um, we didn't have any, anything else, really. That was just two boxes. One box had Node.js and Mongo on it, and the other box had just Node.js on it. So we had a little bit of HA, but not really. So there was kind of, obviously, uh, a few problems with this. Um, uh, I don't regret us building it this way. We kind of needed to get something delivered. Um, but yeah, this wasn't going to scale and it wasn't going to grow with the company. So as we add more engineers and uh, generally more kind of technical people into the organization, having everything on as just a giant monolith, it doesn't really work. It doesn't kind of fit in so well. So we always had the idea of um, using microservices. It kind of made sense. Um, it gets a little bit kind of dogmatic around defining what a microservice actually is, but the whole concept of splitting things out into separate services. So yeah, at this point we had a, a great POC. We kind of wanted to get to the uh, the, the microservices thing, um, but yeah, we needed a, a process or a way of getting there. We didn't, we had to keep delivering features. We didn't have time to stop, rewrite all this thing as microservices. It was kind of like steering a big ship. Um, to slowly move into the right direction. So, yeah, the, the, the kind of um, benefit analysis around microservices, obviously you guys are probably fairly familiar with this stuff, like isolation is um, a, a critical part to this. I need to be able to uh, change my uh, services, you know, if there are bugs in there and break one of the services, I don't really want to impact any of the other ones. We need to reduce that impact. Um, we have uh, a lot of client um, agents which are connecting back into our service. So I wouldn't want a, a, a bug in the billing to suddenly cause all of those agents to disconnect and cause people to get alerts and false alarms and things like that. They also need to be independently deployable. So again, as a case of reducing risk, I want to be able to make a change to one service and know that it's really not likely to have any impact on another service unless they're um, directly kind of... Um, uh, dependent on each other or, or one another, um, and then but with, then we can kind of see that and we can kind of plan around that. Um, flexibility is another key one. So if I wanted to write one of my services in Node.js or Go or Rust or something, then I can do that. If I need to have a separate database for one of my services, then I can do that. Um, we have several databases in our application at the moment, um, all for different use cases. And then this also comes back to the um, team alignment and ownership of the product. So it's kind of important for um, the engineers to feel like they own their part of the application, even if they're not working on a, a large majority of it. Um, as we onboard more people, the product's getting bigger and bigger, um, and it just takes a while for people to pick those things up. So it's, it's useful to be able to put them in a team. They can work on that product, uh, that service eventually kind of take ownership of that or start building a separate service and have ownership of that. Um, and yeah, so there's that breakdown as well. Um, 
one of the issues with microservices is there's kind of some impediments to get in there. Um, you need things like um, infrastructure, managing deployments for the individual services. You're not just deploying one thing, you're deploying a bunch of things. You need kind of automation tooling and things around that. Um, yeah, packaging the deployment. Um, I need to get this one thing distilled down as a package or container or whatever it is you're using to deploy and get that pushed out. Some kind of communication mechanism. So whether you're using a, uh, a centralized bus for communication or they're communicating over REST uh, endpoints, um, and also service discovery. You're firing up a new service. You need to tell the other ones about it. You can put that in config, but it's not very flexible. Um, and so, yeah, th these are kind of some of the impediments we had to work around. Um, and this kind of comes back to um, the actual process. So the way we did it is we kind of started out with the, the monolith. Um, we didn't split anything out at first. We just kind of gradually reorganized the code so that it could be split out. Um, we started separating state away from the um, stateless parts of the application. So that mostly uh, involved moving out um, Mongo and uh, bus services and things like that. Um, splitting out those separate services into um, separately deployable um, uh, uh, application services as well. So they could actually, um, we could build these and deploy them separately, although at first they were just deployed onto the same box. It was a, a, an iterative proce process to get into um, running microservices. Yeah, so the, f the, the first stage of this was to take what we currently had and basically pull all the infrastructure stuff off there. So the first one was to remove Mongo off of that. We moved that off onto its own node. Still wasn't a cluster at that point, just an individual Mongo node. Um, and moved up all the other um, infrastructure pieces. So we have RabbitMQ as a, an event bus um, and um, a, a, some other things on there as well. Uh, one thing that we started doing at this point as well was um, uh, um, we were previously using our product to monitor our products as well, but we were um, concentrating on monitoring uh, resource contention. So we had a lot of things running on uh, one box or um, a lot of things we had running on the same machine they could start starving each other, um, especially when they're under load and they're under different types of load. Uh, we wanted to make sure that one thing under heavy load wasn't, or we could see how it was affecting other services. So yeah, one of our dirty secrets is, as I said, we use Mongo. Um, it's not a popular opinion to say that you like Mongo, um, but yeah, it's, it's done us well. Um, it's, yeah, it just keeps chugging. Um, and yeah, we've, we've, we've had it for a while now. Um, we originally adopted it because of the flexibility. It's really easy to query. You just dump it on a box and go. Um, it doesn't require that much configuration. Um, it's really kind of unpretentious. It just gets on with it. Um, this kind of comes to one um, issue we had a couple of months ago around there was a bug deployed in our query mechanism that caused uh, the load average on uh, one of our Mongo boxes to go up to 142. I've never had a load on any box anywhere near that in three digits before. That, I thought it was fairly spectacular. Um, one of the uh, equally impressive things is that our primary Mongo box has been up for 933 days, um, which yeah, goes to kind of show the resilience that I could have the box running for several hours at a load average of 140 odd, and nothing kind of come, uh, nothing crashed. Um, it wasn't very responsive, but it, it didn't crash. So um, yeah, now we've got the sketch state kind of um, state is the real issue around managing um, scalability. Um, without the state, it's fairly simple to kind of scale these things out. The transient services, you just kind of horizontally scale them um, to a certain degree. Um, and so, yeah, the, 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 the main way, um, well, the first thing to look at is obviously removing the state or kind of segregating state as much as possible into um, stateful services and then keep the stateless ones completely separate so that you're kind of devolve, you're, you're splitting out the, um, the ways you're going to scale these things out. Um, when you work in the stateless services, it's, yeah, I think it's quite important to have um, high availability clusters for them so that you can lose a node and quickly recover from that and bring um, another one back in place. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean it needs to be kind of available in the, the cap sense, but as long as you kind of recover within seconds, that's um, usually good enough. Um, sharding, um, this kind of gets a little bit um, contentious at points, but um, we kind of firm believers in um, sharding your data set um, as it grows. So the, um, the, the certain benefits you get to this 
um, around performance, you need to make sure you're optimizing first. Kind of sharding is a bit of a pain. Um, so you kind of you need to make sure you've kind of optimized the performance as much as possible before you start doing this. Um, but when you do start sharding, there are um, other benefits to it as well. So we can geolocate data. So we have customers around the world, um, Australia, Far East, um, US, Europe, um, and having all their data located in one location kind of works to begin with, but as we grow, it, it doesn't work too well when you've got huge network latencies and um, general issues going on. Um, it, yeah, it's hard to kind of manage when you've got one central point and everyone connecting in from around the globe. So having these things um, sharded that way helps. Um, it also kind of helps for certain data protection issues. Um, some kind of um, customers don't like their data being outside of the European Union. And so um, that, that kind of helps for that. So the V2 is a microservices. Um, yeah, so we'd started splitting these things out. Um, it was a gradual process. So we kind of went from the one monolith to then splitting out um, separate services we had. So we had an exchange that all the, the kind of collecting agents connected back to. Uh, we had a bunch of open source kind of um, collectors uh, supporting open source kind of protocols. Um, uh, and we did gen general background workers were the first wings we split out. They were the ones that were on intensive load um, all of the time. So, um, and then, the, then after that, we started uh, working on our data models and the entities to, to kind of split those out as well. Um, as I was saying, we based this all around a central bus, which is um, based, based on RabbitMQ at the moment. Um, as we kind of scale, that might move off onto Kafka, but um, yeah, that's working fairly well in terms of routing messages around the system. One of the, um, so as I was saying, we were originally just running on Mongo. The kind of the first thing we split off of that was our time series data store. So Mongo is great for flexibility and kind of domain um, like application data, but not really for time series data. This is data that's not changing and coming in uh, uh, really quickly. So the first thing we did is we ripped this off um, and put it into um, React. So um, you guys are probably familiar with how React works, but yeah, it's a, a key value store based on the Dynamo paper. Um, it's kind of a hash distribution around the ring. I won't go into too much detail because I tend to put people to sleep when I'm talking about that. Uh, it's ops friendly, which is a, a massive plus. Um, we can lose a node or a certain proportion of nodes um, and not have any customers affected. And then when we do have these issues or we need to scale up the cluster, the, the command line tools available for scaling the, the, the nodes up and down and the way that it manages transitioning shards around the cluster is, um, is, is super simple. Um, not to say we haven't run into issues around um, um, <laughs> working with the data inside React, um, but yeah, and yeah, it's based on Erlang, so that kind of gets back onto topic a little bit. Um, yeah, so this is kind of our first production ready version, I guess. Um, and it worked well at first, and then um, around two years ago, we onboarded two large customers, maybe a little bit longer, two large customers within a month, um, and yeah, fire happened, um, which is yeah, not good. So um, yeah, customers are dependent on our system for monitoring their systems, um, and yeah, when things aren't working, it, it's, it's not great. Even though we got these things split out into separate services, um, if you're failing to process the data as it comes in, you end up with empty dashboards and it doesn't look good. So what we did is, uh, like everyone else, we put Redis in. Um, so the, the issue that we are facing is that we were yeah, using Node.js and yeah, Node.js is kind of quick in certain regards, but it just wasn't keeping up with the, the workload that we were sending in to um, process the time series data really. Um, so we kind of worked around this by injecting um, Redis in as a buffer so we're reducing the amount of work that um, um, Node.js had to do. And so the, the main issue we were having is that we see a lot of repeated data coming through. Uh, so the, the same time series, but lots of points. And we need to kind of cache certain information about that so we're not constantly looking the things up. Um, and then those, the node has a kind of hard limit of the amount of kind of memory that it can use. Um, and so we were constantly blowing these issues. Um, and, and there were some other issues around streaming that um, uh, Node.js has the kind of stream uh, API that allows you to kind of pipe functions together and it handles the back pressure of things, but then when you break that, um, yeah, it, it's bad. So, um, yeah, so we start Redis in, it worked. Redis, again, is awesome. Um, this just works um, and, yeah, it's pretty powerful. 
Um, but yeah, we, needed, we, we knew we needed some actual proper solution. So um, this is the, the start of the Erlang story. I don't know if you guys have seen this, uh, the, the Erlang the movie, I, I highly recommend it, um, mostly for comedic value. Um, ah, first, uh, another quote, this is uh, from Robert Verding, one of the, 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 one of the creators of Erlang. Um, any sufficiently complicated concurrent program um, in any other language contains an ad hoc informal ins uh, informally specified bug ridden slow implementation of Erlang, which it might be a bit harsh, but generally tends to be true. So um, before we started um, this, we kind of looked at you know, what we wanted to get out of um, the new technology we're going to pick for, to, for building our core back-end systems. Um, it needed to scale, it needed to support being distributed um, for, for scaling purposes and for HA. So um, that needed to be a kind of fundamental part of it. Reliable as well. When we're dealing with the, 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 sh the volume of data that's coming through, um, although the processes could probably crash fairly often and not um, cause any um, loss of data and things, um, because of the way they slowly kind of ramp up to full speed, um, them crashing fairly often has a, a huge uh, impact on general performance. Um, uh, yeah, another one is they need to be generally quick. So um, being able to be uh, natively quick or kind of offload into C um, is uh, hugely important. Uh, production visibility. Um, when you're dealing at uh, this kind of scale, the um, being able to see what's going on in the production systems whilst they're running without massively negatively affecting the, uh, the, the, the performance is a uh, kind of really useful to have. Um, I know this has probably kind of upset some of the um, type system nuts, but this kind of you kind of need this. You can't really get around it. It's not a case of we've kind of misused our types or anything like that. So the first thing we looked at was Java. So uh, a few people in the team had worked with Java before um, for a couple of years. Um, nobody was that keen on um, getting back on that. Um, that was kind of gets to off the fourth point in the that one there. There was no real kind of drive motivation behind doing that. Um, nobody was particularly keen on the language. It's verbose, kind of inexp uh, inexpressive. Um, and then you got the general um, garbage collection madness of suddenly it's just going to garbage collect and you can't do anything. Uh, yeah, this gets on to uh, Jexter's kind of uh, opinion on object-oriented programming. Um, again, probably a little bit harsh, but yeah, <laughs> probably a little bit harsh towards people from California. Um, Scala, uh, we kind of like the look of Scala, but again, still runs on the JVM. Um, and a lot of the kind of uh, negative parts here are just things that are missing or not as um, uh, well, well, well defined as you get in Erlang and OTP. Uh, but yeah, generally it looks um, fairly good, but yeah, it uh, wasn't for us. Uh, we also looked at Go. So Go was obviously uh, the new hipster thing. Um, this is growing pretty rapidly. Um, everything now seems to be being built in Go, Docker, you know, all the HashCorp tools and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's still fairly immature. Um, the performance is really quick, but yeah, this, this, you don't get much, the, the kind of tooling around it doesn't seem, seem to be great, or it wasn't at the time, um, compared to what we get with Erlang. So um, although it'd be useful for building kind of little ad hoc tools and things like that, um, it wasn't something we wanted to build a whole uh, reliable back-end system on. Um, the final one was C. There was a lot of kind of people that wanted to do this just because it sounded cool. Um, but yeah, having built stuff in C before, it's yeah, not, not, the, not the most fun. Um, yeah, it, it, so we kind of, we considered it for a little while, but quickly kind of dismissed it. Um, yeah, really useful for performance critical things. We use it uh, for certain things in our application, but we kind of, uh, only for the, the performance critical parts of number crunching and things. We do a lot of kind of maths to process time series data. Um, uh, we're also looking at Rust for these kind of things that we would previously do in C. Um, seems to kind of have the performance, but the, the languages are more, a lot more friendly to work with. So Erlang. So yeah, some of the kind of key um, brilliant points around Erlang are um, the state and concurrency model that it uses. So you don't have any the, 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 the idea of shared state in Erlang. You have a bunch of processes, and the processes, ma processes manage their own state. 
if you need to update a process or something's gone on, you send a message to those other processes, they update their state. So the actor model you've got here, really, and um, that kind of fairly closely aligns with general human interaction. You know, nobody shares a brain. You tend to communicate via sending messages to each other, whether they're kind of vocal or male or something. So um, this really kind of helps protect the, the, your, your state and, um, yeah, works really well when scaling things out. So it allows you to kind of, because you have these things, these state defined in an individual process, when you need to scale out the processes to multiple cores or multiple machines, there's this, the, the, a lot less work that you need to do to do that. And kind of Erlang takes care of some of that for you as well. Um, I think I saw that all on that point. Supervisors. So um, Erlang has the concept of um, let it crash, which um, at first sounded insane, but um, it's a, a really kind of powerful model. So uh, the way this works is that you have the concept of supervision trees. So you basically define what you, um, how you want your processes that are running to be spawned and how you want them to be supervised. So you, you, you can have a process that's kind of you know, processing some data as it comes in. Um, if that crashes, then you want it to be restarted all the time. If it crashes too often, you might want it to just die and crash the whole application. Uh, but you can independently configure these things, uh, which is really useful, especially around kind of protecting layers of your application. So you might have a, a process running that makes all of your calls to your database backend and kind of caches some things in memory there. You probably don't want that to crash as often um, um, or restart as often uh, as other things. So you'll kind of um, tailor your supervision strategy around uh, protecting different layers of the application. Things that aren't as um, uh, aggressive to the rest of your application when they start up uh, are probably fine to just crash them and, uh, and keep, just keep restarting them. Um, another cool thing is uh, behaviors. So this kind of gets back to the, the maturity and uh, battle hardness of the um, Erlang and OTP system that um, over the last 30 odd years that they've been building Erlang now, it's, um, they've created these um, behaviors, these kind of um, common patterns for doing certain things. So if you have a, a kind of client server model in your application, they have a behavior defined for that. Um, and then way, the way you implement or use that is you kind of, um, you define some callbacks and then say you're using that particular thing. So whether you're using a client server or you're using a finite state machine or something like that, then you basically just need to implement these callbacks and then the um, library code, the OTP code, takes care of all of the other stuff. And it, it might sound kind of fairly simple abstraction, but it takes care of everything. So monitoring the other kind of process that you're connecting to so that if it fails midway, you've got a partial failure midway through, it detects that and will um, handle those issues for you. So you, it avoids a lot of the um, really hard to find bugs that you're likely to kind of come across where it works know the first you know thousand times you use it and then you get the odd occurrence where it will failure and it will fail and yeah it's kind of impossible to track down so there's there's loads of these well there's several of these behaviors that are have been implemented in Erlang um, and yeah they've been tested to death over the years and they tend to be fairly solid so yeah it means you can kind of build these really reliable components for your application with um, uh, yeah fairly fairly easily um, another thing is visibility. So yeah, this gets back to the um, production visibility. So you can actually bring up a GUI, the, the observer, uh, and point it at your um, uh, production application. And you can kind of actually see what's going on inside there. So here you can see there's a bunch of processes that have been fired up. And you can see the dependencies between the processes. Um, you can also see the state, uh, some of the state of these processes as well. Um, and you can send them messages. So if you want to kind of kick things, um, uh, or you know, test things out. You can do that via via this tool or the GUI uh, 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 or the shell you can connect into as well. Um, and yeah, that's, this is massively powerful. Being able to do um, uh, investigation and tracing on live applications is, uh, without really affecting the performance of those applications, is um, really really useful. Um, And yet, the, the kind of the, the, the last kind of major thing is um, 
the, the concept of applications. So um, the, the way that the Erlang kind of virtual machine, the beam works, it's, it kind of feels more like an operating system than a, than a virtual machine. You kind of start these, these application things up, which are a, a, um, a, an independently kind of um, stop, stoppable um, uh, thing that runs inside the, like a, just like an application on your, um, or, or a process in your operating system. You can kind of start and stop these things independent of the rest of them. Um, and so that means that you can start up your stack with a bunch of these applications and then kind of split them out. So you might have an application here, which is a storage application, you know, which is talking to your database or whatever it is. And then you have applications for the other services in your, your app or your stack, as it were. Um, and yes, you can run those all in the same beam. You can run them on separate vi virtual machines. Um, it's really kind of configurable. And they kind of work, well, feel very similar to microservices. Um, and you can kind of communicate amongst them. You can uh, specify in your application that it depends upon a, uh, another application um, and have those loaded up when you start your application or, or check to make sure that they're there and running. Um, and yeah, so that's really quite useful. Uh, a couple of other things. Uh, yeah, distribution um, is kind of at the core, as I was saying, that uh, state's kind of managed inside the processes. You can kind of split these out. Um, to really take advantage of uh, clusters and multi-core machines, um, which is massively kind of useful now as, as um, you, we kind of hit the limit of CPU speed and kind of start to get on larger, lo more and more cores on a machine. Um, and live code reload as well. We've not actually used this, so we build our um, services so that they can just be independently stopped, up, updated, and uh, reloaded. Um, but it's it, it's a, it, it, something that we'll probably explore in the future. So what you can actually do is you're, if you don't want to run a distributed application, so they, it was originally designed for tele, telephony systems, so they were systems that couldn't go down, and so they needed nine nines of uptime. Um, and so they built in the concept of being able to update the code whilst the code is running, and it has a, a kind of um, a versioning strategy in there to kind of um, update the, the, the versions of the code in place um, and yeah, that's been running for, for, for many years and is battle tested. So it's something that would be more fun to play around with than actually um, necessarily useful in our situation, but uh, it might be the case in future. Uh, there are some negatives to um, Erlang at the moment. Um, quirky syntax. Uh, when you first look at it, it looks like someone's vomited on your screen, but it's, um, you kind of get used to it. Um, the uh, smaller community, so the, 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 yeah, the number of kind of Erlang developers aren't as vast as Java or Scala or Go or something like that on Node.js, but they tend to be a, a passionate bunch of, and, and a lot of academics in that area as well. So um, a lot of people kind of looking at kind of distributed systems theory and um, consensus and things like that. So uh, a smart bunch of people. Um, this does have an impact on hiring. It's hard to find Erlang developers. Um, I kind of caveat that with the ones that you do find tend to be really good, so you don't have to filter out as many kind of duds as you would uh, hire another kind of engineers. Um, and also, you can kind of cross train. So we've hired some people that were Scala developers, and they kind of picked up um, Erlang fairly quickly. Um, the, the kind of concepts tend to be the same. It's just Erlang's better at doing it. Uh, the new kid on the block is Elixir. So um, some Ruby people got bored of Ruby not scaling and um, decided to kind of jump on the Erlang um, bandwagon. And so they've, uh, uh, they've invented a language called Elixir, which runs on top of the Erlang VM. And so it can make use of um, interrupting with Erlang code and OTP and all, all the kind of um, mature, hardened um, parts of Erlang, um, but using a nice kind of um, sugary language. Um, there's a kind of a, a few things that are missive, missing from Erlang, uh, kind of like string manipulation, things like that, which aren't um, as good as um, yeah, yeah, other languages or are completely missing. Um, and they've kind of uh, addressed that in Elixir. Um, and so, yes, it, it seems like a nice language. Um, it's one that we're going to start adopting as well. Um, there, there's several reasons for that. As well. um, and yeah, it's growing, it's growing really quickly. Uh, probably not the same speed as like, Node.js and Go have been doing, but um, yeah, it, compared to Erlang, it's growing at lightning speed. So, um, scalable time series. So, um, this is the next stage of our Erlang path. So, by this point, we had replaced a bunch of our uh, back-end services with Erlang. They were performing really well. Um, again, 
it's, a, it's, it's not a great metric to kind of uh, specify the number of resources you went down to, because when you rewrite anything, you're going to rewrite it better than the, you originally wrote the thing. But yeah, we kind of reduced the, uh, the amount of machines that we needed to use when we were moved to some of these services to Erlang. Um, but yeah, the next thing we looked at was um, a really scalable time series database. So we built our own thing on top of uh, React, which kind of got us to a certain degree, but then the, the number of updates that we were processing meant we were kind of having to batch these up and write in chunks into um, React. And it, then you kind of had to manage the kind of failure scenarios around the area with your batching things up, which was Redis at the time. So um, yeah, we looked at another kind of time series data store. Um, another kind of thing around that was that we also wanted a more queryable um, uh, database. So we wanted to kind of run some of these complex queries, do different analytics and apply functions to the data as it come through, um, which would have meant writing all of that stuff ourselves. Uh, but we kind of looked around to see what other things were about. Um, <coughs> we looked at the likes of Influx and uh, InfluxDB, OpenTSDB, um, and uh, a couple of other ones, but yeah, they, they were all, none of them were particularly great and all, all had their issues. Um, and so we kind of stumbled across this one. So uh, we've been using React. We like the idea of React Core, of it kind of manages the distribution. It's kind of a framework for um, building these distributed applications um, and takes care of the sharding and the um, replication. And so we like the idea of that. Um, but yeah, we stumbled across this, which had been kind of written um, on top of React Core as well um, in Erlang. And so it kind of seemed to tick all the boxes. Um, so we started investigating and looked at some of the benchmarks that had been running. Um, and it was kind of, yeah, super quick. So um, I kind of recommend you guys taking a look if you're interested in time series and want to play around. The, it's, uh, yeah, it, it's not as well adopted as other time series databases. So the documentation is a little bit lacking. But kind of once you get there, it's, it's, it's pretty quick. Um, so yeah, at the root of it, there is um, runs on Erlang, um, uses React Core for the distribution. Uh, it runs on top of ZFS. Uh, we use ZFS on Linux, but you can use it on um, uh, other on Unix environments, obviously. Um, yeah, and there's some Postgres in there as well. So the the reason for ZFS is for kind of compressing the data on disk, so we can just write raw data. We don't have to do any compression ourselves. We just write the raw data and let ZFS take care of the um, uh, the, the compression. Um, and we have Postgres in there for uh, creating some different kind of indexes for uh, multi-dimensional data. Um, yeah, so this kind of gets back to the React ring again. Um, and so yeah, it uses React Core for um, distributing um, keys that uh, time series keys that come in um, around the cluster. Um, yeah, it gives you all of the kind of um, high availability, redundancy, etc. Completely masterless technology, so you don't have to worry about particular nodes going down. Um, yeah, as I say, it's a um, a framework. So you kind of um, it, it takes care of doing a lot of the um, the, the, the stuff you need to do around building these kind of systems. So it will detect a liveness, whether a member's up or down, um, does the partition and distribution, um, tells you about the cluster state when things are kind of up and down. Um, and uh, uh, as with React, you get these um, uh, nice set of tooling with uh, React Core to manage your cluster. So you, know, you want to scale your cluster up and down. It, um, that you have all the tooling in place to do that. You just really just have to handle the kind of implementation at the, the, the V node level um, as to what you're actually going to be storing. Um, and yeah, it allows you to kind of monitor the state of the cluster, which is really useful from our perspective. So some benchmarks. So uh, we used a tool called Hagger, which is a, a, a graphite benchmarking tool. Um, uh, Del Martino uh, supports a uh, graphite protocol. Uh, well, there's a way of creating support the graphite protocol. So we fired up a load of these Hagger instances and just started chucking data into um, the Dalmatina cluster. Um, and these are genuine benchmarks we run on kind of fairly moderate hardware um, in terms of the, the, the performance you can get. So yeah, kind of average between three to four million metrics per second, which is, yeah, there's nothing else that I've seen that gets anywhere near that. Um, and yeah, it kind of linearly scales as well. So when we fired it up to five nodes, uh, you get the same um, uh, level uh, uh, of performance. So uh, we wrote a blog post on it as well. So uh, we looked at all of the other time series databases, as I was saying, OpenTSDB, um, Influx, uh, Graphite, et cetera, et cetera. We got a little bit of kind of heated feedback on this. 
Um, obviously, they tend to be a little bit opinionated, but we try to re reproduce the, a kind of standard set of tests to run across these to actually get an idea of what, which ones are kind of quicker. Um, these are supporting reads as well at the same time. Like You can get kind of skewed uh, metrics back from these things if you're just accepting writes and never actually reading from them. Um, and we work with um, Heinz, who was the guy who wrote, the, uh, uh, who wrote Dalmatina to kind of uh, improve certain aspects of that as well to you know, make it more efficient for reading. Um, etc. So yeah, you don't get any of this for free. There are some trade-offs. So um, when it comes to processing time series data, we um, we have no kind of strict guarantees around your data. It is possible to lose your some data. Um, I know that sounds terrible, but when it, when it comes to time series, if you lose a couple of seconds or a few points of data, you're looking at trends anyway. So it's not um, that bad. Um, and it, this, this is also guaranteed. It doesn't mean you're actually going to use your data. So you can configure the cluster in such a way that um, you've got several replicas, and so you'd need to lose all of those nodes um, to lose the data. The only reason we don't guarantee any data uh, protection is uh, for a certain window of time, things get buffered in memory. So if all of the nodes with that replication of data went down at the same time, you would lose like 10 minutes of data in memory for a certain set of metrics. So yeah, there's no guarantees around um, your data making it to disk, but that doesn't tend to be an issue. Um, and yeah, you're kind of more likely to lose data elsewhere from uh, different parts of the pipe spilling over and things. Um, uh, yeah, you have to kind of be careful around the memory usage um, and caches, so you have to kind of allocate um, some memory for ZFS to do its thing as well. Um, you kind of, we have to set things up um, in order to make things more optimal for reads. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it, it's part of the way that the, 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 the Dalmatina works, the way it kind of indexes data um, in a kind of consistent format as opposed to having direct lookup indexes for the data. Um, but yeah, I won't get into too many specifics because it gets a little bit boring. Um, yeah, we only support 32, uh, 62-bit floating point numbers. Uh, a couple of those bits are saved for different flags. Um, so yeah, we're a little bit less uh, accurate than some systems, but yeah, a couple of bits don't tend to, to matter that much. Um, it also has a pro proprietary binary protocol. This was kind of a little bit difficult to adopt. Um, yeah, you kind of have to um, reverse engineer the binary protocol at the moment if there's not a, an SDK that works with this um, for the language you're using. But if you use an Erlang, you're sorted. So yeah, this is kind of what we ended up with, which is not too dissimilar to our, uh, uh, the, the, the first architecture diagram. So we'd, um, we've split out the systems uh, into separate uh, services. Um, we have a, a huge ring in the middle for our time series data store, um, and then just a bunch of background workers processing the data as it comes through. So yeah, we tend to avoid having state um, uh, as much as possible um, and try to keep those the actual stateful parts in one particular separate from the, 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 the non-stateful parts of the application. Um, and yeah, this is where we got to at the moment. This isn't the kind of, we're not done, we need to kind of keep going. But as I say, we're, we're, we're a company, we need to make, you know, we need to build features and keep iterating on the, the stuff that's going to add value to customers. Um, and so we kind of work on this, uh, the microservices stuff as we go. Yeah, so stuff we learned um, during our... Um, Erlang adventure is um, some of these things weren't, uh, I've kind of touched on a little bit, they weren't as obvious when we first started that how valuable they would be. So yeah, a massive one is live code tracing. So being able to look at what's going on in a, a running application and being able to kind of um, prod it and poke it and get stuff out is massively useful. Um, again, the, the let it crash approach, um, it took me pr probably longer than other members of the team to get my head around why this is particularly useful, especially when um, certain parts of the, the, the system crash. Um, that, that it's a general, uh, <laughs> the general approach for Erlang. Um, it does actually prove to be really useful. So you don't need to handle all of your um, edge cases and uh, protect against failures throughout, littered throughout your code. You kind of write for the, the, the sunny day scenario. And then when things go wrong, you kind of catch them and restart them. And obviously, you're looking at logs and uh, monitoring how well these are performing. Um, and then, so if something is actually going wrong in your application and there's a bug that you need to fix, then you can grab it at that point and fix it. But most of the times, things just crash for 
random reasons and they're not that critical to, they're not things that need a, a fix straight away. So this keeps your processes just up and running and, uh, and ticking along. Yeah, and the, again, the community, um, we, we knew that it was going to be small, but we were kind of fine with that. But yeah, we weren't quite, we didn't realize how, um, yeah, how kind of, how passionate and how strong the, the Erlang community is. Um, they kind of, I think they're growing in numbers now, especially with the adoption of Elixir, but um, there's a, a lot of smart people working in um, Erlang and pushing the things forward. Um, another thing is we, got, uh, we have a, a fairly close relationship with Erlang Solutions. Um, so they're kind of consultancy, Erlang consultancy that um, we use for outsourcing um, uh, different parts of the, the application that need building. So they have a, uh, a large uh, bunch of Erlang engineers that will, um, uh, that you can kind of uh, off, off, uh, offload work onto to help. They also kind of help with training up some of the, the team as well. Um, and it's useful to kind of be able to fall back to the kind of um, a bunch of guys that are really uh, experienced in the area. So what's next? So we're going to Erlang all of the things. Um, specifically, all of the back-end workers are going to be Erlang um, eventually, um, and, and, and probably changing the APIs as well to, so we get rid of all of the Node.js and we'll use Erlang and Elixir for all of those things. And yeah, I really want to play around with the live code reloading. It sounds, it sounds fun. OK, uh, this about wraps it up. So uh, yeah, kind of closing up on the, um, the startup stuff. Um, if anyone's looking, if there anyone is doing a startup or they're kind of looking at it, that this is kind of the, the things I wish I'd known when starting um, a startup. Um, yeah, try to kind of ignore the dogma as much as possible. There's a, a lot of people who say you shouldn't be building these things in certain ways or you shouldn't be as scrappy. Um, yeah, you kind of just have to get on with it, uh, get it working, make it fast, and then, yeah, I'll just shard the hell out of it. Um, you can be a little bit over, over the top on uh, making sure you build the most elegant distributed system possible. But then when you look at all the success stories around um, uh, technology companies, they tend to, to follow this approach, um, at least in the early days. Um, yeah, be scrappy. Um, you need to get stuff delivered. Um, but always, yeah, kind of there's the, the one that's kind of forgot is that you have to kind of come back to pay your debt. So yeah, you need to be scrappy, get things delivered, but then kind of come back and fix these things up. You can't just wait until your system's on fire. Um, and yeah, don't rush to the shiny things. Um, it's always a tendency to see the new cool technology and want to use it straight away. Uh, Docker comes to mind um, uh, and all of the kind of uh, technologies and things that are around that. Um, yeah, it's not always a good fit. It might take a while. Um, yeah, uh, and that's pretty much all I've had. So thank you.